Our sermon text today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and then verses 6 through 8. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us go to God. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds this day. May we take what we hear, may it fill our lives, and may we use it for your good in this world. Amen. Amen. Today is the second sermon on our three-part series on the Beatitudes. Last Sunday we learned that the Sermon on the Mount was a collection of sermons, one that Jesus used to teach his disciples and all of us about faithful obedience of the heart. The B attitudes are a collection of promises. They're a code of ethics on how we, as children of God, should be living. They are blessings from Christ to help ground us in our faith and keep us moving forward with our loving God. Last Sunday, we looked at three B attitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, those who know that without God, they can do nothing. Blessed are those who mourn. Those who love, comfort, and bless others as God has blessed them. And blessed are the meek, those who are in control of their lives because their life is controlled by God. So today we are going to look at blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. As we begin, we need to keep in mind that in order to understand and apply the Beatitudes to our lives, we must see them as simple, straightforward sayings from Jesus. The philosopher Soren Kierkegaard made reference to the importance of hearing the Gospel in a primitive way. He says, stripped of all refinement that we so often bring to any difficult text in order to avoid its meaning. To approach the Beatitude simply is to hear the words clearly, without prejudice, and to know that the words are spoken directly to us. That is from the Feasting on the Word Commentary. So our goal for today is to break down each of these three Beatitudes so that we may clearly and simply understand what Jesus is teaching. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Think back to the last time that you were hungry. The last time you said, I am starving. The last time you said, I am so hungry, I could eat a horse. The last time you so deprived yourself of food that you got one of those hunger headaches. When Marcy's father was starving, he used to say, I'm so hungry, my stomach thinks that my throat has been cut. I don't know what that means. But he always said that when he was really hungry. When we find ourselves in that state, we can usually solve the pangs in our stomach by eating a snack or ordering a bigger meal. And how long has it been since you were thirsty? The kind of thirst that makes your throat dry and sore. The type of thirst that is quenched only by drinking a huge amount of liquid very quickly. Again, we can usually solve that issue by turning the tap on in our house and watching cold, clear water flow from a pipe and into a glass. All of us here today are very fortunate to have the resources that we do that so many others in this world do not. And in biblical times, the whole concept of hunger and thirst was very different. William Barclay in his Beatitude book explains what hunger and thirst meant in the days of Jesus. He says a working man's wage was an equivalent to about three pence a day, and in, in today's exchange rate, that's about a nickel. No one ever got fat on that wage. A working person only ate meat about once a week. 
And if something happened and a person could not work one day, they were never far from the borderline of real hunger and starvation. And in reference to thirst, he says, water did not flow from a tap. An individual might be on a journey, and in the midst of it, the hot wind which brought the sandstorm might begin to blow. There was nothing to do but to wrap the head in a burnous and turn the person's back to the wind and wait, while the swirling sand filled the person's nostrils and throw it until they were ready to suffocate and until they were parched with an imperious thirst. In the Bible, a person's hunger could not be solved by a quick trip to the store or the refrigerator. A person's thirst could not be quenched by getting a drink from a vending machine or going to 7-Eleven and buying a big gulp. The technology and resources that we take for granted were not available back then. In Jesus' time, there was no fridge or freezer to store food to keep it fresh. There was no shops that readily supplied what, what a person needed. No interstate or trucking system to deliver food. No organization or nutritionist to monitor food safety. When Jesus mentioned hunger and thirst, it is in the context of life and death circumstances. So when he says, blessed is the person who seeks after righteousness, who wants it as much as a starving person wants food, and a thirsty person needs water. God wants us to be seeking after righteousness. That is goodness and honesty, justice, decency. It is something that we are ever striving for, ever trying to obtain, ever having within our grasp. It's not good enough to be good. It is vital for God that we are filled with goodness. And that's a lifelong process because lurking close by our decisions and our intentions and our motivations is our sinfulness. It's important for us as God's children that we are not only filled with goodness, but we are forever seeking goodness. Blessed is the one who longs for goodness as a hungry person longs for food and a thirsty person longs for water, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This beatitude seems pretty straightforward. Blessed are those who show mercy to others, and as such, mercy will be shown to them. This is a recurring theme all through the New Testament. This idea of what you give out, you get in return. It's all over Scripture. Second Corinthians, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive those who have sinned against us. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. And the most famous of all, in everything, do to others as you would want them to do to you. It's not only an important fact about the journey of life, it is equally true about our journey of faith. What you give is what you get in return. If you give others misery, you will be miserable. If you take advantage of others, you will be taken advantage of. If you give goodness, you will receive goodness. If you are kind, people will be kind to you. If you show mercy, you will be shown mercy. But my commentary says that this beatitude is a bit deeper in meaning. The Hebrew word for mercy is an untranslatable word. It does not mean only to sympathize or only to feel sorry for someone. Mercy in Hebrew means the ability to get right inside the other person's skin until we can see things with their eyes, think things with their mind, and feel things with their feelings. Now, how much better would we be if we could treat everyone that way? How much better would our relationship be? How much more in tune would we be with God if we could display the kind of mercy and goodness that would allow us to see and think and feel what others are feeling? 
I think it would make us more genuine. I think it would make us more forgiving. I think it would make us better people. I think it would enhance our relationship with God. If you think about it, is that not what God did for us? By sending Christ to be fully human with us on earth, did God not see things and think things and feel things just as we do? When Jesus walked on this earth, he saw the injustices around him. He saw the suffering of God's children, the indifferences of those who would not help, and the resilience and love of the human spirit. When Jesus walked the earth, he thought of his mission to tell the world what God was really like. The healing and miracles that needed to be accomplished. The parables to demonstrate how we should live and the potential of what God's people could accomplish. When Jesus walked the earth, he felt the love of his friends, the commitment of family, the compassion of his followers. He also knew, knew what it was to be alone and denied and abandoned and betrayed and misunderstood. He felt pain and suffering and death, and he felt what it was to be the Savior to us all. God conveys to us a kindness that comes from the very depth of our humanity, and God calls us to do the same. Blessed is the one who can see other people with their eyes, think with their thoughts, and feel with their feelings. Whoever can do that will have the same done to them, for that is what God has done for us in giving us Christ. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think this beatitude is hard to follow. I feel most of us have pure hearts. The Greek word for pure meant the following. It was used to mean clean. It was used to describe corn that had been sifted and cleansed. It was used to describe metal that was free of any impurities. I am sure that we are all clean and sifted and free of impurities. We try and serve God each day. We are kind to our neighbors. We are honest to a fault. We don't lie or cheat or steal. We pay our taxes, we eat our vegetables, we say our prayers, and we take our vitamins, or vitamins if you prefer. But as good as we all are, we are never quite sure how pure our hearts are. When we do good deeds, are we seeking recognition? When we help others, are we expecting to be thanked? When we excel in our careers, are we wanting more status? When we do selfless acts, are we really expecting nothing in return? In other words, there is not any way that any of us can be absolutely pure in word or deed. We all, St. Paul tells us, have fallen short of the glory of God. So how do we proceed, or why do we proceed? Well, we go forward by trying our best to be pure and clean every day. We go forward by realizing that we will at times fall short. It is going to happen. We go forward by relying on God's grace to keep our hearts clean and pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will not only see God, they will know that God is with them. So once upon a time, there was a stone cutter. That's what he did. Just so we're all on the same page. A person who took a hammer and chisel and wrote down rocks. And he, it took some, it required some skill to be able to do this. And he was a very good stone cutter. But he didn't make much money from it. He, he lived in a run-down shack. And, and he ate whatever he could find. And his clothes were all tattered. And one day he's out chipping away at, at stones. And he hears this noise coming down the path below him, and he looks down, and he sees the king coming. The king coming with his court, the king coming to cheers and, and, and applause from, from the people of the kingdom. And he thought, wow, to be a king, now, that would have power. That would have status. He said, I wish I were a king. 
And because I started the story with once upon a time, we can all believe that when he said, I wish I was Cain, the heavens opened up and the thunder clapped and all of a sudden he became a king. And he liked being the king. He, he liked having servants and subjects. He liked living in a big palace. He liked taking care of the people in the land, of wearing fancy royal silk clothing and being very important. And one day he's out in his royal garden and he's admiring all that he has and he, notice, he notices that it's a very hot day and the sun is beating down on him so much that his royal clothes are getting all sticky and, and he's getting all sweaty and he's not really feeling like a king because the sun is changing how he feels and who he is. And he thinks that's real power, that's real status to be the sun. So he says, I wish I was the sun. And just like that, he becomes the sun. And now he's up in the sky and he really feels the power because he's above everything. And he's got the ability to warm the air. He's got the ability to make things grow and make things wither and wilt. And he really feels that he is now all powerful. Until one day, a rain cloud happens to flow by. And it stops right in front of the sun. And it takes away all the sun's powers. Now everything's dark and gloomy and the sun isn't shining. And he says, wow, maybe the real power is in the clouds. So he says, I wish I was a rain cloud. And just like that, he became a rain cloud. And he loved it. Because now he could fly around the skies. And he could drop rain wherever he wanted. He could make things grow and flourish or he could flood things out and make them worse. And he really liked that sense of power and status. But one day he noticed that the only thing on the entire earth that was never affected by the rain in any shape or form were the big boulders. So they must be the most powerful. So he wished he was a big boulder. And just like that, he became a big boulder. I think it's boring, but to him, that's where the power and the status lay. And he loved this new power because he was big and he was strong and nothing on the earth could move him. And he was unmovable and unchangeable and unshakable. And he liked that. That was power. Until one day, an ordinary man came up to him carrying a bag. And he took out a hammer and a chisel and he started chipping away at the big boulder. And the man realized that that was where all the power lay. And so he wished one last time that he was a stone cutter. And that was what he became. And he still lives in the mountains to this day. And he still searches for whatever he can find to eat. And he still has tattered clothes. And he still lives in a little run-down shack. And for the first time in his life, he is happy and he is content. So here's the question. What is it that makes you happy and content? What is it in you that gets you that center, that peace in your life? What is it? Who is it? What place is it that sends you there? I'm going to give you three seconds to think about that. Don't answer out loud. Just think about it. And whatever that is that gets you to that place of peace and focus and contentment, you are very lucky to have that in your life. And if your answer to yourself, to what makes you truly at peace, wasn't your relationship with God, then now you have two things in your life that makes you happy and full of content. That's what God gives to us. The be attitudes are these code of ethics, these promises, these rules of guidance to live by, so that we can be our best, so that we can be happy, content, Focused, righteous, merciful, pure people with God's help. Let us pray. Gracious God, take this work for me as your blessed people. And may we share those blessings with others now and always. Amen.